Okay, now you are in for a treat. Uh, it has, uh, he has been a perennial favorite speaker at the conference, someone who I assume you all know. Uh, the person, of course, who coined the phrase we've used at least 100 times so far, customer development. You know him as the author of The Four Steps to the Epiphany uh, and his new book, The Startup Owner's Manual, but I know him as a teacher, as a mentor, as an investor, a board member, uh, and most importantly, as a friend. Please welcome Steve Blank. So, uh, as Eric said, my name's Steve Blank. I had to write it down because I'm getting old. Um, I, I remember uh, when Eric became the first lean practitioner, the number of uh, lean practitioners had doubled. Um, and, and so, uh, my talk today uh, really is for two audiences. Uh, uh, the first is for those who fund, manage, and incubate, accelerate, and teach new ventures. And for the rest of you who are in new ventures thinking, okay, I could go read my mail and whatever, I'm going to suggest uh, you might want to pay attention because it's uh, potentially a preview of how investors will be evaluating your startup in the next couple of years. Um, you know, I'm going to be using the word evidence-based entrepreneurship a couple of times in my talk, and I thought I'd just get it out of the way, is evidence means for the first time ever using lean principles. We could get early evidence of how a startup is progressing way before we ever get users and revenue. Now, one of the interesting things about how this all started was over a decade ago in reflecting on my experience as an entrepreneur, I realized that everything we had been told about how to build startups for 50 years was simply wrong. Startups were not smaller versions of large companies. You know, that business plan that investors had made us write were wonderful things that should probably still be taught in universities, but it should actually have been taught in the English department because they were the best examples of creative writing uh, you ever would have done. And that five-year forecast in the back of every plan, you know, income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow, we were actually p asking people to forecast five-year plans on a series of unknowns. And the only people other than venture capitalists who had asked those to do that were the Soviet Union. And, and we know how well that turned out. Um, so what we observed is that startups weren't smaller versions of large companies. What large companies did were execute at their core known business models. Of course, they also innovate along the periphery, but because they're large, they constantly do the same thing year after year, better and better. But startups, the insight was startups don't execute at all, at least not on day one. The mistake we were making was thinking we were executing. Startups actually search for a business model. And that's the core for me, for Lean. In fact, it helped me understand that for the first time we could define what a startup is. A startup is a temporary organization designed to search for a scalable and repeatable business model. So if we take a look at the Lean Startup, for me, it consists of a business model canvas. Alexander, I use Alexander Osterwalder's canvas because I find it helps us frame all our hypotheses a customer development process, a process to actually get us outside our building or lab to test those hypotheses and turn them into facts. And an agile engineering and development methodology so we can actually build minimum viable products and get feedback as early as possible. Now, I kind of joke that this started with Eric and I, but now that there are thousands of you here physically today and even tens of thousands online, I want you to all understand the size of the community that's now talking and speaking about Lean. Because this May, the Harvard Business Review put the Lean startup on its cover. We've gone mainstream. So congratulations to all of you. What I found out this morning is there have been over 500,000 views of this article in English over 100,000 downloads of the PDF, which say do not copy, so that means an average of 5.5 copies per PDF. 
So we could think about over a million people have read about the Lean Startup. And by the way, if you want a free copy of the article, go to steveblank.com, click on the icon, and it'll take you to the Harvard Business Review article. And then it was translated into nine separate languages for another 250,000 people reading about this. Harvard Business Review told me it was one of the most popular articles they've ever had. Now, one of the interesting things is that a lot of people have been struggling on, yeah, this is great, we've read about it, and it's kind of like, Lean Startup is kind of like going to Ikea. It looks good in the store, but now you've got the pieces to assemble at home. And how do we actually do that? And that's why I'm sure a bunch of you have actually paid money here to figure that out. Um, and hopefully one of the speakers are going to tell you how to do that. Um, but it's not going to be me. Um, but what I have done for others is decided that instead of just talking about these components, why don't we put on a class? I used to teach, believe it or not, how to write business plans, and then I used to teach customer development. But then I put together the first Lean Startup class at Stanford. And we decided to make this an experiential, hands-on class. This is a team-based class where teams come in with a series of hypotheses about their business, but they run experiments outside the building in front of customers. In fact, in the class, you have to talk to 100 customers in 10 weeks. And why I mean talk to, I don't mean Skype or something else. I mean watching their pupils dilate in person. 100 customers get data and pivot or iterate on your hypotheses. And we assign mentors to each one of these teams. Now, what's really interesting is I taught this class at Stanford. And then one day, after I blogged about what happened in the class, because it was the first time it was ever taught, I got a call. And the guy at the other end of the phone that said, hi, you don't know me. I'm from the US government. We need your help. And the last time someone said that, I ended up in Vietnam. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know. I said, no, no, no. He said, no, no, no. We're from, we're from the National Science Foundation, and we've been uh, running this program called the SBIR and STTR program where the government says to every one of our national research organizations, you have to save 3% of your budget for commercialization. And he said, Steve, we've been giving out checks for the last 30 years, and if the government ever bothered to ask how they were doing, we'd all be in jail because we've essentially been giving out cars without uh, driver's ed. Um, we want you to put on the class for our top scientists in the United States. And so my Stanford class ended up becoming, and I've taught and set up the first several of the classes, the National Science Foundation Innovation Corps. And sh you should all know that the Lean Startup is how the US government commercializes our most interesting and innovative science in the US. Now, the National Science Foundation, because the word science is in there, wasn't happy with just, yeah, I think the teams are doing well, and look at that pivot, isn't that neat? They wanted some data. And not only did they want some data, they wanted a lot of data so they could make go and no-go decisions about funding. And the other thing they wanted was, Steve, some of our teams are going to be in Washington, but some will be in Iowa, and some will be in Florida, and some will be in California. We need to be able to look over their shoulders while they're getting out of the building because we want to see what the results of their customer discovery interviews were. So we built some software for them called Launchpad Central, which I'll talk about in a second. But you should know there is now 2,200 teams doing a version of this Lean Startup, Lean Launchpad class, the National Science Foundation Innovation Corps. And the last thing, by the way, I should mention about the Innovation Corps is that for the first couple of years, this class was voluntary before you could get funding from the NSF. Until I got a phone call this year, another phone call from the NSF, that said, uh, Steve, we got some data back on um, success rate for funding. And I said, yeah, why are you calling me? He said, well, you should know that for the last 30 years, the average funding rate of proposals at the NSF has been 18%. Yeah, OK, well, why are you calling? Well, we got some data back, then we looked at it for a couple of months, and we weren't sure it was right, but we're now pretty convinced. The average funding rate of proposals, double-blind, National Science Foundation, a 
of teams who have been through this class get funded 60% of the time. Um, yeah, well, you know, I was looking at the phone going, that's a marketing number. I mean, you know, like I would have made that up. So um, I, I was feeling pretty good. It's taught at 44 universities worldwide, the 30 accelerators and incubators using it. And um, I'm sure we have a lot of companies here or online, Fortune 500 companies, GE, uh, Merck, et cetera, are all uh, uh, using and experimenting with a lean startup. One of the unexpected consequences of uh, dealing with the National Science Foundation is we were teaching the scientists who live inside of major universities. And about half of them went back to their own universities pissed, going, how come we're not teaching our engineers this process? And of course, they said, Steve, how come we're not teaching our engineers this process? So we ended up putting together a class for educators. And so we now have the Lean Launchpad Educators Seminar, which is put on through a nonprofit, uh, NCIIA, uh, where they'll teach, and I'll teach, uh, 75 educators a quarter. We ran another version of this class, which I'll just mention now and talk about a little more later when it makes sense, for incubator and accelerator managers. These are two, two and a half day classes on how to actually learn how to teach this class and process to others. Now, one of the things, the, as I mentioned earlier, the National Science Foundation wanted was a way to collect data about how are the teams doing? How many pivots are they making? What's their customer development process look like? Tell me about that interview. And they couldn't stand over the shoulders of each one of the student teams. And in fact, when I try to do this at Stanford, I try to use WordPress. I don't know if Matt is still here, but thank you, I love the software. Um, but it just didn't scale past four or five teams because it wasn't really built for customer discovery. So a group of my XTAs, teaching assistants, went off and wrote something called the Launchpad Central Software, designed specifically for the National Science Foundation to collect detailed data, live data, on the customer discovery and lean startup process. And it basically gave us weekly progress. It showed us an experiment scorecard. Think of it as a Kanban board in nine dimensions for each part of the business model canvas. And allowed us to take a look at all the data, all the experiments, the trajectory, and something called the investment readiness level. And let me just show you the type of data that came out of this Launchpad Central software. You should think of this as we've instrumented a startup for the first time. We've actually put sensors on every part of the lean process. So if you're an incubator or accelerator manager like the NSF, you could take a look at a leaderboard. Here's a list of 13 of the top 25 teams in the cohort. We could actually take a look at the number of customer interviews on the highest level that the teams have done this week, hypotheses that they're testing, the number of invalidated hypotheses, et cetera. We actually have some high-level data about how's our cohort doing. We could generate automatically a business model canvas, and automatically it would update weekly for the teams and for the instructors to see. We can actually track all the hypotheses that are being tested and see which ones have been validated or invalidated. Um, and then we put together a scoreboard, a nine-way Kanban board with data. For the first time, we could get past just saying, oh, pivot, and I've iterated it, and look at my MVP. We now have some real metrics we never had before. Now, we could then take this data and do some advanced data mining and take a look how each one of the teams in my cohorts are doing. Now, before I tell you what we did with this, I just want to tell you that what we decided was even though the National Science Foundation wanted it for themselves, this Launchpad Central software was pretty Good, and in fact, not only pretty good, it, it was capable of giving incubator managers, corporate incubators, accelerators, for the first time, some real data of what's going on inside their teams. 
And so we commercialized the software. It's now available for use at launchpadcentral.com. And in fact, I, I think some of the Launchpad Central guys are here. Is anybody here? Yeah. Raise your hand. So if anybody wants to talk to uh, those guys, uh, I think they'll, you guys can be around after the break. Yeah. Okay. Um, there they are over there. Uh, but what was interesting is what we did with this stuff. About 40 years ago, NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, would launch rockets, and most of the time, instead of hitting the moon, uh, they'd hit Amarillo, Texas or something. Um, I mean, s stuff you know, would explode and parts would fall off, and, um, and NASA realized that what they had was a reliability problem, not just that parts would break, but when people said stuff was ready to be put on a spacecraft, ready really had a kind of flexible definition. There wasn't even a common definition of what flight-ready hardware and software meant for spacecraft or even the rockets. And for NASA, you know, like getting it wrong wasn't like you, you know, like went home and didn't have pizza that night. It meant like there was 10 years worth of work. And so what they came up with was something called the technology readiness level, a thermometer, literally a visual metric with some simple words so every program through every subcontractor could have a common definition for what's admittedly an incredibly complex set of data. It was a formal way to assess project maturity and quantify relative risks, and it was data-driven. It was adopted first by NASA, then the entire Department of Defense, then the FAA, then the European Space Agency, and the technology readiness level was kind of used for mission-critical projects to have a common language. And it says something like this. You know, your project's at level one and two if you're doing basic technology research. Uh, you're at level three and four because you've now proven feasibility. Levels five and six, you could demo a prototype. Level seven, eight, and nine, you're ready to deploy this thing. Level nine, you're ready to put it on a spacecraft. Now, what does this have to do with a lean startup? Well. The question is, remember all that data we got in Launchpad Central? For the first time, we're now capable of coming up with a common language to describe the readiness level for early stage ventures. Not only startups in the field, but even more importantly, startups incubators inside of large companies. How do you convince an existing business unit with a common language that, no, no, this startup, this new project really is at a level that's worth integrating into your BU or spin out or fund? And so what we thought is, why don't we take that data from Launchpad Central and come up with our own version of the thermometer we call the investment readiness level? So we think we could do the same for new ventures, with, an with emphasis on data and evidence. And the investment readiness level is just like the NASA one. It's a formal way to quantify relative risks. It's data-driven. And the analog is to the NASA DOD technology readiness level. And again, here's a sample, a generalized case, because you can, in fact, define these levels any way you want. But here's the generalized case. Levels one and two is, uh, do we have hypotheses? Did we create all the hypotheses on the business model canvas? Do we have the value proposition detailed? Have we, in fact, discovered our problems and solution fit? Do we have a low fidelity minimum viable product? Have we validated product market fit? Is the right side of the business model canvas validated? Um, have we validated the left side? And do we actually have investable metrics that matter? Now, again, this is a generalized case. As I said, inside your company or accelerator or incubator or inside specific industries, you could tune these numbers. Now, what's really interesting is that about 10 years ago, baseball and the Oakland A's gave us the equivalent story of what's going on today. I don't know if any of you remember the Oakland Athletics in 2002, but they couldn't win a single ball game. There was a new manager named Billy Bean who said, you know, we're competing with a $40 million budget with the New York Yankees who have a $125 million budget. There is no way we could buy the 
same players they want. And someone in his organization said, well, that's because they're looking at the wrong metrics. We should be looking at new metrics with new data that we have as on-base percentage, slugging percentage. We could beat the New York Yankees by building a better team by looking at data, by playing something called Moneyball. And what we can do is actually deploy this investment readiness level. Here's an example for medical device company where the investors have kind of rated them four out of nine. But we could, in fact, use this for Moneyball. Find players with the money that we do have. I like the rest. Got an ugly girlfriend. Ugly girlfriend means no confidence. You guys are talking the same old nonsense. Like, we got to think different. Your goal shouldn't be to buy players. Your goal should be to buy wins. And in order to buy wins, you need to buy runs. We're going to shake things up. Why don't you walk me through the board? I believe there's a championship team that we could afford because everyone else undervalues them, like an island of misfit toys. He can't throw. But what can he do? He gets on base. We are card counters at the blackjack table. We're going to turn the odds on the casino. So at first glance, this process seems ludicrous. You know, startup success is all about the team or the founder or the product or the market. No metrics can measure these intangibles. I just want to remind you the Yankees believe that too until the Oakland A's beat the stuffing out of them by playing Moneyball. So um, I just want to remind you to kind of enclose, God is not on the side of the big arsenals, but on the side of those who shoot best. Um, and uh, if you're interested in um, actually how to build this for an incubator and accelerator, um, we teach this class through NCIIA. You could uh, take a look at it, and uh, happy to see you there. Um, oh, one more thing. One more thing, if I can. I almost forgot. You know, in the Startup Owner's Manual on the Four Steps to the Epiphany, um, I said this process works for any industry, any company, anywhere in the world, except for one industry that this would never work for life sciences. That in life sciences, how it works is you get published in Nature, Cell, or Science. You get VCs excited because you found a new target or new gene. You raise $100 million, you spend 10 years in the lab, you go through FDA trials, and maybe you have a billion dollar company or a $100 million hole in the ground, and that's all that there was to it. And that's what I believed. Until some very, very smart people at one of the leading life science and biotech universities in the world, University of California at San Francisco, UCSF, the head of entrepreneurship, Stephanie Morris, who might be here. Stephanie, are you around? Over there. Started chasing me for two years and said, Steve, you're not just wrong, you're damn wrong. Life sciences doesn't work like that at all. And I said, Stephanie, you should read my book. It says so right here. It's like, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, it says it doesn't work. She said, Steve, we are the leading... Your no, I said, no, no, no. And Stephanie persevered by getting me out of the building in front of the leading venture capitalists in Silicon Valley in therapeutics, diagnostics, devices, and digital health, who all said, Steve, we're desperate for this. The life science and venture capital industry is collapsing because we haven't figured out how to be efficient in our use of cash. People are fleeing this asset class. Help us figure out how to be more efficient. And of course I said, well, have you read my book? It says it doesn't work. And they said, no, no, no. This is the most important thing for this industry. So in my particular style, I said, well, if it's that important, you're going to teach the class with me. And what we did is we put together the mother of all lean launch pad classes. And this October at UCSF, we had 26 teams, 110 students. They talked to 2,307 customers, validated 987 hypotheses, and pivoted 436 times. Some of the leading scientists in life sciences, some of the leading clinicians, the head of surgery of UCSF, teams were sneaking out from Genentech. Tonight, at 5.30 in Mission Bay, 
is their final demo day. Their lessons learned presentations are tonight, and you could see the investment readiness level live. See you there. Thank you.